Hello, good morning everyone. Hello. Hello, so welcome Hello. into our lecture. I'm starting the whiteboard now. So first of all, can you tell me, please, do you know, do we have lectures next week? No, we haven't. Next week is a break between the blocks of studying. Oh. So next week is a break and then you have your exams, right? Uh, actually, on the next week we have exams. So I say remember okay. on the Saturday next week we have your exam and on the uh, Thursday we have uh, exam on kimchi and other elective exams on the next week. So you don't want any lectures on Tuesday and Wednesday next week or do you? Probably not, I can guess. But uh, if you still like to have some lectures, we can do it. But normally, as, as far as I understand, today is the seventh week of our term, and that's why it should be the last lecture today, right? Yes, but maybe you can introduce on which topic we will have lectures. Uh, yes, so basically today, We'll discuss some further useful techniques used in data mining. Uh, we'll touch upon uh, the methods of, you know them actually, of machine learning, uh, which are continuation of data mining. And then uh, you will have uh, today and tomorrow uh, you will get further home assignments, which you will need to do before uh, before your final exam. So basically your final exam would be, uh, as I said, just a defense of all your labs and homework. Nothing really that much complicated, uh, provided that of course you have been doing everything uh, in our labs. Uh, one very important point, which I started discussing yesterday. Uh, can you see my whiteboard? Yes, you can. Okay. It's a very interesting thing, which is called fractional order differentiation. Fractional order differentiation. of time series. <clears throat> so once again, uh, suppose that you have time series XT for a certain discrete set of uh, time values T. <clears throat> what is first order differentiation? We know very well. So for example, as we did As we did yesterday, uh, it was, for example, delta x computed at uh, point t0, which I denote by delta x0, which would be x0 minus x minus 1, <clears throat> for example, right? And so on. Delta x, <clears throat> to reduce writing, I would say, at point minus k, 
is x at point minus k minus x at point minus k minus 1. at t minus k. <clears throat> what is a uh, uh, total cap? Uh, why do we use first order differentiation? Because very often applying first order differentiation is the simplest way of getting your time series stationary. There are other ways. So for example, if it is a Brownian motion, you can get stationarity by dividing it by the square root of time. If you know the origin and time at which you assume that your uh, time series start with zero. But normally your process is not a simple Brownian motion. You don't even know uh, its law of distribution. You don't know uh, any stochastic differential equation for it. You don't know any law uh, according to which the process evolves. So you need some easy and straightforward way of how you can get it stationary. Normally your time series xt by itself would be non-stationary. And uh, so please just, you know, that's very important. Uh, we uh, why do we need uh, stationarity in the first place? Why am I uh, emphasizing uh, this point that we really want it to be stationary, stationary, stationary? What for? Calculate correlation. For example, yes. If uh, it is not stationary, then any type of correlation analysis becomes invalid. We can't do it. So a very, very important thing is first of all, get it stationary and only then apply correlation analysis. Or indeed, any other analysis of the process distributions. If the distribution depends on time, which is non-stationary, not necessarily it's a correlation between the two processes, anything which deals with either distribution of XT itself or mutual distributions of XT and maybe some other process. If the distributions depend on time, then there is absolutely no way of analyzing those distributions statistically because at each point where you extract your data, there will be a different distribution with different parameters. In particular, uh, let's say different uh, cross correlation. If it is stationary, then whatever distribution we have, it would be the same, conceptually the same in all temporal points. And we would be able to somehow model that distribution and therefore uh, extract uh, parameters and learn something about the distribution. So any type of distribution and in particular correlation analysis is only enabled if we have a stationary process or multiple stationary processes. And yes, the easiest way to get from a non-stationary XT to uh, hopefully stationary uh, process is to compute the first order differences. We compute the first order differences and then we apply, uh, apply uh, the unit root test, a unit root test because there are many of them, uh, unit root test. Uh, as discussed uh, yesterday, it's not the only way, but uh, it is a very good idea. So for example, you got those uh, delta x, and now you say that delta x uh, t, you rename it, so it is now your yt. You apply a unit root test to yt. So you try to model it in the form as yt equals to some coefficient a times yt minus one plus uh, some epsilon t where epsilon is, let's say, normal distribution. Let's say, for example, with zero mean, some standard deviation, it doesn't really matter. What does matter 
is the value of a in this case okay assume that yt is centered already so expect that value of yt is zero uh, and let's recall from uh, the lecture yesterday uh, what do we expect for the value of A uh, in order to get uh, a stationary process? A should be less than 1. Because once again, uh, if we say uh, yt minus yt minus 1, and this is delta yt, uh, which is a minus 1 times yt minus 1 plus epsilon t. In the continuous setup dropping um, the random term, this would be equivalent to an ordinary differential equation dyt equals to a minus 1 yt dt with a solution yt equals to y0 exponent of a minus 1 or we denote it also by b if you remember uh, times t then it would tend to 0 if b is less than zero uh, and this corresponds to stationarity otherwise uh, it is either constant and, and then still subject to a random perturbations uh, epsilon t which give rise to non-stationarity or even uh, in, even tending to infinity which is an explosive behavior so are you is... sure uh, b should be less than zero not a u uh, of course, uh, you see. What is B then? Uh, B is A minus 1. Uh, so I denote ah, okay. by, right? So yt is y0 exponent of bt, where b is A minus 1. Then obviously when b is less than 0, then yt tends to 0, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, otherwise, otherwise non-stationary. Uh, so b being a minus 1 should be less than 0, which immediately tells us that a uh, should be less than 1. So that's precisely the condition which I put here. So in order to perform your unit root test, in the simplest case, you construct first differences. Uh, you unit root test important concept you try to in the simplest way to model your process this way as uh, let's say uh, yt uh, being a times uh, yt minus one and uh, you estimate uh, the value of a in this case uh, we did not do it in your assignment uh, when we were constructing the correlation function uh, you assume straightforwardly in that case that your first differences are already stationary, but in fact you should perform a unit root test and estimate the value of t. Uh, the value of t can be estimated using your uh, how would you think you, you, you can estimate the value of t? And the value of t can be estimated from your correlation function, actually. So assuming that, uh, assuming that uh, such a representation is possible, uh, then suppose that um, there is such a representation, then we multi again multiplying the left hand side and the right hand side um, uh, of our equation uh, by uh, yt, uh, we would say variance of yt equals to a 
times correlation of yt, yt minus 1, uh, depending obviously on your uh, unit of time, I put t minus 1, which means one unit of time, which could be one tick, one second, one minute, one hour, whatever. And uh, epsilon is independent of yt, and therefore, uh, sorry, uh, a times covariance, obviously, not correlation, but covariance of uh, yt and y, uh, t minus 1, simply by multiplying with yt. And then, obviously, from here, uh, you uh, get a uh, being uh, the covariance of yt, yt minus 1, divided by variance uh, of yt. It is not exactly... Uh, the correlation, but assuming that uh, the variance of yt and variance of yt minus 1 are similar, uh, then what you'll get? So it is covariance of yt, yt minus 1 divided by variance of yt, which is the same as covariance of yt, yt minus 1. Uh, divided by the square root of variance of yt and square root of variance of yt as well. Obviously, it is an identity, right? And now modifying this by variance of yt minus 1, assuming that they are same, And then, obviously, we have immediately standard deviation here and standard deviation here. And therefore, it is precisely uh, the correlation of yt, yt minus 1. So if you get, uh, I'm not uh, discussing the details uh, because it might be uh, much more complicated. If you get a value as a result which is significantly less than 1, so this one, all right? Uh, then uh, you can assume that uh, your assumption that uh, the process is stationary and this is indeed a correlation and covariance, they do hold and you, um, uh, you, can, you can say that you have passed this unit root test. On the other hand, if as a result you got a value of A which is close to 1, or indeed, if you got by formally applying this formula value of A, which is greater than 1, which means that there is no stationarity at all, and uh, A is not representable anymore as a correlation, actually, because the correlations would depend on your time cross-section, then your unit root test fails, and as a result, uh, you must say that uh, there is no stationarity in this case. Typically, the first differences would give you the stationarity. Uh, this belongs to the area of stochastic process and mathematical statistics. Um, I would not dwell that much on this, just uh, please be aware that a family of unit root tests do exist. And when you apply first differences, then uh, you should consult with uh, say literature on unit root tests. There are many of them. Uh, and ideally, we skipped it in our uh, work last week. So you immediately proceeded to uh, estimation of your correlation function. But in general, you should apply unit root tests of a kind like presented here in order to understand uh, whether we have stationarity uh, or not. And if it is stationary, okay, we work with our first differences. If, for example, if first differences that seldom, but can happen if seldom, those differences are still not differences are still not stationary. 
please, could I ask a question before yes. we go to further? So to, to conduct this test, we need to calculate the A, which is the correlation between Yt and Yt minus one, yes? You uh, I anticipate your question. You say, how could we compute this correlation if we do not know in advance that uh, they are stationary? Mm -hmm. So yes, you are right, actually. Uh, my point is, it is only a very simplistic scheme which I put for you here. But the basic idea is, apply the formulas like correlation to compute this coefficient A. Just for okay, but it you just for it. one T, and should we uh, take the oh, mean value of? So, so same thing by, by universal mm -hmm. shift, by universal shift as you did. Uh-huh. Okay. If you get a value which is significantly smaller than one, given your uh, let's say unit of time, uh, then uh, you can, by applying uh, certain results from statistics, you can say that not only uh, this means that you formally computed this correlation coefficient, but if indeed it appeared to be significantly less than one, then you can accept the hypothesis uh, that uh, your time series are stationary, and then this is indeed the coefficient, if it appeared to be significantly, uh, significantly less than one. If on the other hand, it appears to be clo uh, close to one or indeed greater than one, then greater than one immediately would mean that it is only a formal result. It cannot be a correlation, right? Uh, how it could be more than one if it is a covariance divided, basically the formula of correlation of two variables? Uh, it can be numerically. <clears throat> uh, how can it be? Imagine that maybe you can disprove that uh, you <clears throat> apply this formula to time series which are not actually representable in this form. So suppose that uh, we, we assume that it is a, a covariance provided that, that the covariance is same in all cross sections. So we first assume that there is a stationarity and the formula like here, uh, like, like this one, does indeed apply. But assume that you got absolutely arbitrary uh, time series uh, for which uh, this uh, parameter is uh, variable. So do you think that uh, can it still be greater than one or not uh, in this case if this representation doesn't hold? So if it is... Uh, an absolutely arbitrary series. No, you are right, actually. Thank you for pointing it out. Mathematically, it would still be less than one. So you wouldn't get values, uh, in this case, uh, greater than one, simply due to, you're absolutely right, due to uh, triangle inequality. So even if this representation doesn't hold, you wouldn't get a value greater than one, but you can get a value close than one in which case you cannot accept the hypothesis that they are stationary. And uh, in that case, uh, the value of A, which you are getting, is not a real correlation because there is no stationarity here in the first place. Yeah, thank you for pointing it out. Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay, yes. That, that's the correct statement. Uh, that's why it is called a unit root test. So basically unit root means that the value of A approaches unit, approaches one. Uh, you can, instead of uh, just one step model here, you can apply uh, a deeper model considering yt minus two and so on, and still construct a characteristic equation and check whether uh, any roots of this equation are close to one or not. Uh, for the moment, for the moment, for the sake of simplicity, I applied uh, only um, I applied only one step. Uh, I, uh, basically, an AMA type. This is AMA exponential moving average, uh, effectively model. 
uh, with only one step dependency, which is probably sufficient to uh, estimate the coefficient. If you are deeply under one, uh, then uh, you can assume both. Uh, I'm not going into the details of these statistics now. Uh, they are available. Uh, so what are the maximum value of A under which you can still assume a stationarity? Uh, there are precise uh, statistical uh, values uh, given your confidence level, how big A could be, uh, so that you can still accept your null hypothesis of stationarity, or otherwise you refute the hypothesis of stationarity. In uh, your experimental computations, by the way, of the correlation coefficients, you have seen that for the first differences, uh, the coefficients, uh, you remember you worked it last, uh, last week, very, very quickly decay to zero, all right? In your Python assignment. Right. So this, uh, although we didn't compute the statistics explicitly, but this informally supports our hypothesis that yes, uh, we got uh, first differences being stationary. If for whatever reason, first differences appear to be non-stationary, what do you think we should do in that case? Calculate the second differences. Calculate the second differences, you're absolutely right. So in that case, we calculate the second differences. Uh, once again, what we are talking about now is not at all related to uh, whatever prices of uh, USD, ruble midpoint, or anything like that. This in general applies to any time series which you can get from absolutely any source. And this is an absolutely general technique used in data mining. Uh, how would the second differences look like? So in this case, uh, yt would be, let me denote it by delta squared of xt. And this would be, again, assuming uh, that uh, we selected a time step equal to 1, where 1 could be just any unit of time. Uh, just for, for, for the sake of simplicity, I write it that way. Uh, that would be, uh, what is the second difference? This is x0 minus, obviously, x minus 1 minus, uh, okay, xt minus x uh, t minus 1 in general, minus xt minus 1 minus xt minus 2, which is then xt minus 2 times xt minus 1 plus xt minus 2. That's the formula for second differences, and so on, so on, so on. Uh, it is extremely unlikely that you would need to get to third or further differences in order to gain this stationarity property. It is more even likely that you don't even, you may not even even need first differences to get stationarity. You need, as we discussed, mentioned last time, fractional order differences. What are fractional order differences? You see that um, the formulas for calculating the differences are some linear operators which are applied to your time series. So for first order, once again, you had xt 
being uh, sorry yt the first order differences uh, which is delta xt which was xt minus xt minus one so basically that type of difference for the second order you got xt minus two times xt minus one plus xt minus two all right and so on so in general you see that your difference operator whatever which i denote by let's say delta of some order alpha uh yt applied to xt is some kind of linear combination of your x values so in general you can write it in uh, in the form of some from let's say k equals to zero to plus infinity some weight omega k x t uh, minus k so for example for first order you get omega zero being one omega one uh, being interestingly enough minus one for the second order uh omega two plus are all zero for the second order omega zero is one omega one is minus two omega two is one omega three plus a zero all right so what if we devise certain values of omega which correspond to fractional order differentiation and you know what we can indeed do that so let us define it uh, in the following way uh, we would define them recursively so omega zero would always be one okay it is one in the first order you see here it is one in the second order and then we define omega k as minus omega k minus one multiplied by alpha minus k plus one divided by if i'm not mistaken k yes divided by k where alpha is the order of differentiation now let us see uh, obviously for let's say a third order and so on uh, you would get similar formulas due to a binomial coefficient so uh, by the way here can you tell me please what would be the formula for the third order you remember the pascal triangle of binomial coefficients one minus three three one yes minus three absolutely right is three uh what is omega three in this case i believe this is one uh, minus one i think negative one yes minus yeah. one yes minus one uh because it is not a plus b to the power of three but it is a minus b to the power of three you see for the first order we had a minus here uh, and omega four plus would be zero and so on now consider this general recursive formula for the omega coefficients omega zero is one subsequent omega k is minus omega k minus one alpha where alpha is the first is the order of differentiation here alpha is one here alpha is two here alpha is three and so on so let's see for example what would be for alpha equals to two okay omega zero is one 
omega 1 is minus 1 times 2 minus, in this case, k is 1, 2 minus 1 plus 1 divided by 1. And interestingly enough, it is minus 2 as it should be. Omega 2 equals to uh, minus omega 1, therefore minus minus 2, therefore plus 2, times now uh, k is 2, alpha is still 2, 2 minus 2 plus 1 divided by 2, and therefore uh, it is plus 1. And you know what? We recovered the first, the second order formulas. Uh, okay, and for example, if we compute omega 3 here for alpha equal to 2, then you will get out of sudden 0. Omega 3 is minus omega 2, therefore minus 1 uh, times alpha, which is 2, minus k is in this case uh, 3, okay? plus 1, oh, divided by 3, and this is 0. Once we got 0, due to our recursive formula, because omega k is proportional to omega k minus 1, then all subsequent uh, omegas are 0 as well. So interestingly enough, this formula, depending on the value of alpha, if alpha is integral, then it would correspond to integral order coefficients for computing the differences. If alpha is not integral, then we have an infinite sequence of omegas, uh, which give us a formula for a fractional order differentiation. Please have a look at this. Uh, are there any questions? It is a very, very nice, and I would say, a reasonably recent result in uh, time series processing. It was probably known in mathematics for quite a while, but only very recently in the last, I would say, few years, this technique became very popular. Are there any questions about this? Everything is clear. Okay, everything is clear. Then the question is, why do we need the fractional order differentiation? Not to keep in mind every coefficient or every order of uh, differentiation. We would probably like to find alpha. Suppose that the scenario is the following. Suppose that we already found that delta of the first order xt is stationary. Already. And then the question is, but do we really need first differences? Try to find in this case, minimal alpha, minimum alpha. In this case, alpha would be greater than zero, less than or equal to one, such that uh, delta alpha xt is stationary. That's what we want. Saying so that delta alpha xt is stationary. Why would we want this? Taking differences results in some undesirable properties from the point of view of subsequent machine learning. Um, we can't say that taking first differences is information loss because the original 
time series obviously can be reconstructed as a sum of first differences. So basically your data are never lost. But uh, the experience shown that the more you preserve of your original data, the better. So applying your subsequent machine learning techniques to first differences rather than to uh, the original data may have uh, may lead to some uh, I would say not information loss but results which are more difficult to interpret and qualitatively understand uh, in subsequent machine learning applications. For that reason uh, empirically it is now considered to be a good practice if you found that, for example, uh, a certain integral order differences, let's say first order differences, are stationary, uh, then still search for the minimum differentiation order alpha, which would yield stationarity of uh, your time series. If, for example, it is alpha being, let's say, 0 0.8 instead of 1, uh, for which you can already apply a unit root test and uh, validate that your time series are stationary, then uh, use a small order. So 0 0.8 instead of 1 differentiation in order to uh, process your time series. You may eventually get more useful information about your uh, about the behavior of your model in that case. And you know, uh, it is not only applicable to time series, it is the whole new branch of mathematical analysis, which is called fractional order analysis. In your classical mathematical analysis, yes, you are dealing with derivatives so of the first, second, and so on order. It is the whole new mathematical analysis developed recently. Well, not so recently, but recently became popular, which is called fractional order analysis, uh, which uh, has become very important uh, for many applications. Uh, for many applications. Uh, so, if you are interested in anything like that. Please let me know, I can forward further information to read for you about that. This is one of uh, hot modern topics, which definitely plays significant role in modern data science. So keep this in mind and apply Correction order analysis if necessary. Okay, so uh, that's what we got. And uh, your computations, which you have performed last week, they, as far as I understand, what they indicated, what kind of correlation function you got. As far as I understand, in most cases, you got Uh, a negative correlation between two subsequent price increments. Is it correct? Uh, the correlation uh, obviously uh, between delta x uh, 0 and delta x 0 is 1. And typically you got a negative correlation between delta x 0 and delta x 1 in the numerical experiment you performed last week. Is it correct? Please recall what kind of results you are getting. What kind of what kind of correlation function you uh, you eventually got? I auto think correlation function. Auto correlation function, yes. Did you, did you examine it? So what kind of results you got? Okay, you get one uh, for, for k equal to zero. 
what would be the typical value for one positive or negative from the results which you have submitted and i have seen then in most cases you got a slightly negative value for one for example at the level of minus 0 0.2 And then it could be just anything like that. Do you recall uh, getting autocorrelation functions like that? You see that it is slightly counterintuitive because from the market maker structure point of view we have examined previously Um, we derived that it is more likely that two subsequent price increments would move in the same direction. And therefore, the autocorrelation function of two subsequent delta x values should probably be positive. The fact that most, of, as far as I have seen, most of you got a negative value uh it warrants some interpretation it may depend on the way of how you constructed those values actually uh it might be because uh can you uh, by the way that's a very typical question which you could expect in your final exam which is in your final defense so the question would sound like that. So please listen carefully in this case. When you constructed the price increments tick by tick in your autocorrelation analysis. Uh, so first of all, what kind of price did you take for XT? What kind of price it was? It was midpoint price. It was the midpoint price using your constructor order books. Absolutely correct. Now, a more subtle question would be the following. Suppose that we are now at some T0. Uh, we look at uh, T minus 1. So what is exactly the previous time instant t minus one? So what are in general those time instants which you use in order to produce the sequence of prices? So what I mean, you have a certain price x zero here. You have a certain price x minus one here, all right? By construction of your time series, does it always mean that x0 is not equal to x minus 1? Which means that by construction, you dropped all events in which the midpoint price didn't change. Or you included in your time series all updates of the order book including those in which the mid price possibly did or did not change. You see the point. So for example, uh, there was a T minus one, there was a certain order book with uh, midpoint price X minus one. Then what is the next tick? Let's say T zero. Is it any update to the order book or it is only an update which resulted in a midpoint price change. Because there could be an update to some upper levels, for example, uh, remote asks or remote bids of your order book, which did not result in the midpoint change. Because in this particular case, uh, you computed midpoint as just arithmetic midpoint without taking the VAPs, as far as I remember. For the sake of simplicity. So what are your ticks? 
any updates to the order book or only updates which result in midpoint price change? That would be my question to you, and you should be able to answer it. Both answers are correct, but you need to tell exactly what you have done. So please tell me, anyone. Uh, we have any. 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 So, x0 being not equal to x minus 1, not necessarily. Any update. And if it is any update, then this may indeed, I wouldn't say fully explain, but at least provide a hint as why we got a negative order correlation in this case. Uh, probably, because in this case we, suf we, we, we significantly increased uh, the number of cases when there is no change at all. There are probably some cases uh, when uh, the delta is zero uh, and when the delta is negative. So my question is, uh, if we count only those where x0 is not equal to x minus 1, could it change any, uh, could it change uh, the autocorrelation uh, picture in that particular case? Um, what happens is that, uh, suppose that there are, uh, the values are centered, so we would have uh, sum from k equals to uh, 0 to plus infinity, x uh, t, uh, well, let's say t from 0 to, uh, to, to, to infinity, x t, uh, x t minus 1, something like this. So basically what we do in a great number of cases, there would be a zero here, which means that uh, sizable movements would correspond to larger, well, uh, larger uh, shifts. Uh, so it wouldn't be between t and t minus 1, but the previous value which really corresponded to uh, the midpoint being different would be, for example, x minus 2 or x minus 3 um, and so on. And we would uh, instead get uh, zeros here. So whether it could affect the correlation function, I guess yet, I guess yes. So if you are interested, it is not a task for you, but if you are interested, you can perform a different type of experiment by dropping from your time series any values where a midpoint does not change, and then retain only those when it does change. When x0 is either greater than or less than x minus 1. And on those restricted time series, Check what autocorrelation is going to be, whether you still get uh, the correlation at uh, k equal to 1 being negative, or maybe it is positive in that case. Would be very, very interesting to see. Uh, it's not mandatory, but if you're interested, it would be a very interesting uh, numerical experiment to do. Okay? But all in all, uh, the autocorrelation functions you obtain, they look sensible. We need to possibly to address this little bit counterintuitive uh, negative first autocorrelation. But apart from that, but apart from that, it is uh, all uh, all generally okay. Uh, one minute break. I will respond to a phone call, and then we uh, continue from there.
Okay. Uh, now, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, yet another point, which is uh, you read the paper on Hayashi Yoshida indicator. What is it for? What have you got from that paper? I deliberately asked you to read this paper so that you can navigate in modern publications on uh, statistical data analysis with applications to data mining. This HY is indeed a data mining technique. Uh, so what is it all for? How is it different from constructing autocorrelations uh, we have studied uh, so far and discussed so far? What is HY for? Autocorrelation was formed for the synchronous processes because you have uh, synchronous time six for the post process that we make. The one is shifting, the one is shifting. But uh, for two securities, for example, we have a synchronous process. It's not the uh, same time ticks. You are absolutely right. So HY, short for Hayashi Yoshida. Uh, so Hayashi Yoshida. Hayashi Yoshida. Uh, correlation estimator. It is for, for two time series. with non-synchronous uh, with non-synchronous uh, updates update times all right a very important point do we need to apply this correlation estimator again to stationary possibly first difference time series or not necessarily? For autocorrelation, we applied first differences. Okay? Here, do we need to apply first differences? So for no. example, we have XT, YT. What do you think? The answer is, of course, yes. We still need them. We still need XT and YT to be stationary. Whatever correlation estimator we apply. So, apply first differences or fractional order differentiation first. There is absolutely no point to apply any correlation estimator. There is no magic, any correlation estimator, if uh, your time series are not uh, not stationary. Just absolutely no point. Okay. And then the essence of Hayashi Yoshida is uh, once you apply uh, apply this estimator to stationary time series. Uh, is about the following. It is really for non-synchronous update time. So how to deal with non-synchronous update time? That's that's what is important. Uh, so how do we deal with uh, non-synchronous update times? 
Well, suppose that there are uh, two timelines, X and Y. And there are different update times here. So how do we estimate the correlation? So suppose that um, suppose that um, we consider this interval Uh, this interval, uh, I would think that, uh, okay, we're applying first differences, okay. So we have, uh, let's say, delta x, uh, sorry, delta y uh, i here. How do we construct the correlation and suppose that they are already centered? So the expected value of delta x equals to the expected value of delta y which is zero, so they are already centered. Uh, what do we do? In order to estimate the covariance between X and Y, you remember this formula, so what do we do actually? We construct the sum for all, let's say, uh, covariance between delta x and delta y, because we're dealing with first difference in this case. It is, let's say, sum for y from 1 to n. Um, what do we do? We take delta x, uh, delta y i, but delta y i corresponds to for example, two values of delta x. Within this interval when delta y changes, we have delta x j and delta x j plus one, for example, in this picture. So what do we do? We multiply delta y uh, i by what? Maybe by the average? Uh, in general, we need to multiply by both, actually. So in this particular case, assuming that there are uh, two of them, uh, yes, so we take delta yi uh, multiplied by delta xj plus delta yi multiplied by delta xj plus 1. But you are absolutely right that uh, we need to, uh, in this case, in order to uh, uh, preserve uh, the normalization of those values, uh, we need to compute the fraction which applies to both of them. So for example, Within this interval delta y i, there is a certain period of time uh, which uh, let me denote by tau j, which corresponds to overlap with delta x j, and a certain one which I denote by tau j plus one which corresponds to overlap with delta xj plus 1. So we multiply the first product by alpha j and multiply the second one by alpha j plus 1 in this particular case where what is alpha j and alpha j plus 1? What do you think? It is the fraction of time for which this overlap occurs. So alpha j is tau j over the total uh, over the total tau j plus tau j plus one and alpha j plus one is similarly tau j plus one divided by tau j plus tau j plus one. 
if uh, in some particular case we have, for example, a delta x interval, which would be completely within uh, the corresponding uh, delta y interval, then uh, uh, it would come with, uh, obviously the geometric picture would be uh, different and you would need to uh, compute uh, compute the weights uh, in a similar way. So basically the idea is to compute the covariance using Hayashi Yoshida indicator, you compute the covariance with particular weights uh, with respect to all intervals of one time series overlapping with each interval of the other time series. A very simple thing, actually. Effectively, you can think of that as introducing other modification points uh, in the middle of uh, our intervals due to overlap. Technical implementation of this is not difficult, but we, for the lack of time, we didn't do it uh, because it is a little bit, uh, I wouldn't say tricky, but it requires a little bit, uh, a little bit of programming care. Uh, for you, uh, an important thing to remember is that this uh, correlation estimator does exist and it is useful in uh, estimating covariances and then uh, correlations between uh, time series with non-synchronous update times. It is a kind of uh, state of the art, de facto, uh, the standard way of uh, estimating correlations between high frequency update events. And a question could be, um, you remember for which purpose in the first place did we compute the autocorrelation function? It is not just for our general interest there was some very specific purpose why we computed, uh, computed the autocorrelation function, for example, for our prices, as we discussed previously. Why we did it in the first place? To see if, if it makes sense to, to make predictions from the previous values to the future values, if there is a correlation between them? Well, generally, yes. So we did it because we wanted to see whether a Brownian motion based model, so for example, a model with uh, some kind of uh, in the small independent of each other, normally distributed, most importantly, independent from each other increments, is viable in the first place. And the result is. Probably yes. So uh, if so we are in the boundary case between yes and no. If for example we would have a correlation one obviously at k equal to zero, then the correlation, let's say either big positive or big negative for one and so on. So if this correlation function would be like this or for example something like this we would have significant correlations significantly different from zero at k one two and so on then it would mean significant uh, dependencies between subsequent increments and the main assumption, you remember when we were discussing the model based on the Brownian motion, is that the increments of a Brownian motion corresponding to non-overlapping periods of time should be independent, which also means that the correlation between them is conceptually zero. In reality, in practice, in our measurements, they should be close to zero. 
And we are wondering actually whether we can assume that. Because if yes, then uh, models which are based on Brownian motion increments are in general valid. And we can use these models uh, in order to, yes, model uh, one dimensional, possibly two dimensional, and so on processes uh, which occur in uh, our high frequency setup. And the answer is generally probably yes. Even the largest case by absolute value correlation you were getting uh, was about minus 0 0.2. It's not like, you know, 0 0.9 or minus 0 0.8. So correlations very quickly decay uh, to zero. Uh, you, in this case, have a slight anti-persistence at minus 0 0.2, which says that the increments are not exactly independent uh, with each other, but nevertheless, uh, they are, uh, nevertheless, they are, uh, I would say relatively close to zero and close to uh, and close to uh, the correlation is relatively close to zero, so they are close to be independent. And this is a good result on its own. So we don't have a strong persistence or very strong anti-persistence between them. Strong persistence would be, uh, let's say, uh, autocorrelation close to uh, one being uh, for k equal to one close to plus one. Strong anti-persistence uh, means close to minus one. None of these results we actually experienced in practice. So this is relatively good from our modeling standpoint. And because of that, it makes perfect sense to apply uh, correlation analysis in uh, Hayashi, uh, in the sense of Hayashi Yoshida. Um, but the point is, it's not just correlation in Hayashi Yoshida which we really want to obtain. It is something different. Okay, you can uh, take, for example, X being your uh, herb tomorrow. You can take Y being uh, USD herb tomorrow. For example, is zero tomorrow, and you obtain uh, uh, you obtain a correlation between them. All right. And so what? Why do you think? Uh, what kind of? another application, very useful application, we can make all this Hayashi Yoshida, uh, Hayashi Yoshida estimator. Uh, if we got a correlation, like a, 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 a good correlation between them, this means that when, when one price changes in one of them, the other changes, for example, when the ruble drop to the USD, probably it also drops to, to the uh, Euro. So we can expand our model and put more features to have a better prediction? Well, first of all, yes, you are absolutely right. So far in the feature analysis we're doing, we collected features from one time series only, all right? So for example, for USD Ruble, we collected features for USD Ruble. For your Ruble, we collected features only from your Ruble time series. So yes, you say, and this is absolutely right, you can use mutual information if correlation is not zero. Can use mutual information, mutual information from multiple time series. to enhance your predictions. That's absolutely right. And you know what? You can even strengthen this mutual information. You can, in particular, use so-called lead lag analysis. And this means the following.
suppose that suppose that the correlation between let's say delta y del delta x delta y by itself suppose that it is nearly nearly zero so it would mean that there is little mutual information you can get by itself right but now suppose that okay x is your robe usd is uh, y is usd robe suppose that we can guess that usd robe is the more liquid financial instrument and therefore what will typically happen uh, is that if the change in the value of ruble occurs then it first manifests itself in the change of usd ruble at only after a small while a short while it manifests itself in an update in euro ruble so what does it mean even if Suppose that uh, the correlation is nearly zero at this stand. A change in euroable, I'm uh, sorry, in USD ruble, would have impact not on the current, but on little bit future values of euroable, which means that if for example we shift our time series for euro ruble shift in which way forward or backward if for example delta y has an impact not on delta x but on little bit future values of delta x what do we do in order to reveal this we obviously shift x backward in order to overlap future values of euro ruble with the current value of y of usd ruble which means that after this shift the correlation <coughs> after shift of uh, x by some tor the correlation of delta x shifted by tor and delta y can immediately become noticeably for example greater than zero <coughs> for example this would mean that indeed there is a lead by tor y leads by tor let's say ticks or microseconds or whatever the x series so what you can do is to find tor which corresponds to the maximum correlation and this is precisely the lead lag analysis if we eventually got tor greater being greater than zero uh, in this case suppose that tor is uh, a backward shift so this is a backward shift by tor for example x is backward shift by tor if tor is greater than zero then it means that we, we we do a backward shift by of x by tor and therefore we expose future values of x to overlap with the current value of y which means that y leads x by tor and therefore uh, x lags legs y if on the other hand tor is negative then it means that x leads and y legs this is called lead leg analysis 
and I think in the final assignment, one of the final uh, assignments which we are going to discuss tomorrow, you will be asked precisely to do lead leg analysis and as a sub routine to this lead leg analysis to implement Hayashi Yoshida. So that will determine the lead leg relationship between your ruble and USD ruble increments, not the values of course, increments. And maybe performing fractional load differentiation as well. I have a question on that. Yes, uh, what you just were saying about like if one market is more liquid than the other, can we build a model that basically doesn't require any training, but just monitoring two two markets and uh, with a common currency? Yeah. And when one changes, it basically an arbitrage situation, and just if it fast enough, it can always arbitrage the market and. Uh, yes, you can. yes, you can. So uh, your question is whether we can build a model without this lead lag analysis, just taking into account deltas in both of them, right? Exactly. Uh, yes, we can. Uh, only it is more informative and more instructive to understand which one leads and which one lives, actually. So uh, if you build a joint uh, model, or, or I would say mutual information model, which does not require lead lag analysis, then uh, it would be like the following, because you don't know which one leads and which one lags, you would need to build a model which for each value of delta x and delta y would somehow in this model consider both actually the future and the previous values of the other time series, because you don't know which one leads actually. Uh, which is slightly inconvenient. Whereas if, for example, you know that euro is always behind USD, well, not always, but systematically behind USD, then you would make a model for precisely for euro because it is better predictable. You already have a USD signal which predicts what happens to euro. And that model would require only past values of USD because you know that your reacts on past events which occurred with USD. Your ruble uh, reacts on past events which occurred with USD ruble. So uh, although this lead lag analysis is not mandatory, it is very useful in order to simplify your subsequent modeling. In that case, you would need to uh, effectively for better predictability model only one asset out of the two and you would know what to expect and uh, how the second one uh, affects uh, the first one. I would say that. Okay, thank you. Okay, so fine, we are done for today, but please still stay tuned because tomorrow you will get an important final homework, uh, which you will need to do uh, before your exam. Okay. okay. Uh, could I ask a question mm -hmm. also about Hayashi Yoshida algorithm? Yes. So could you show the picture with uh, two lines? Uh, yes, yes, I'll try to, yes. Yeah. So we started with some uh, some of the security, for example, with Y firstly. And for the Y we found, we, f we finding the intervals corresponding to the Y why J take one as the main one and mm -hmm. consider its increments and then for each increment of the main one the main one could be x as well obviously i just drew it that way that why is the main one um, um you find all overlapping intervals uh which correspond to the second one mm -hmm. okay and are there some uh, preferences how to choose the main one so the most earliest one? Mm, probably from the computational point, it is more convenient, although it is a very good question. You know, we can address it in uh, our numerical implementation, which we'll do from tomorrow on. Mm -hmm. For me, it looks a little bit more convenient for the main one to choose the one which changes less frequently. Mm -hmm. 
So for each delta y, and by the way, in this case, in that case, I, I, I did it wrong because your typically changes less frequently than USD, but okay, this is an example only. Probably it is a better idea to um, take for the main one less frequently changing time series and then for the other one all overlapping uh, changes uh, for each delta delta y for example although i don't think there is any any principal difference here okay but what if uh, on the first on the very beginning of our sequences the faced with this situation when we have y uh, j for example and there is uh, delta x j plus one but instead of delta x j there is an empty space so it just so this, uh, is a boundary, this is a boundary effect mm -hmm. unfortunately in our correlation analysis we always experience these boundary uh, boundary values you know boundary effects what you see mm -hmm. um, there are some standard ways of dealing with this i think we will uh, discuss that in detail. Uh, what I put here is only a sketch of the algorithm. You really mm -hmm. need okay. to make sure that many other properties are satisfied. So, for example, why I introduced weights? Uh, I introduced weights in order to uh, provide valid normalization to time of uh, all our time series. Uh, whether we can do without them. Um, how we compute correlations, what we do with um, indeed missing values. The answer is very simple. A missing value is substituted with zero because these are deltas. So if a delta is missing, it is perfectly valid to assume that the delta is zero. But indeed, there are a lot of technicalities when it comes to implementation of this algorithm. And I think we will uh, present to you all those technicalities and ask you to implement them tomorrow when you start implementing this uh, HY. So the task for tomorrow would be, uh, not for tomorrow, but we, which we will get tomorrow, will be, I would say, a rather interesting. Taking these two time series, you will need to play with different values of Tor. So for example, you will be given Tor in microseconds, uh, let's say 10, 20, and so on, up to maybe 100 microseconds, or maybe up to 1000 microseconds, something like that. And for each tour, by the way, both positive or negative, because we don't really know which one leads and which one lags, you would need to compute the correlation between the shifted, uh, one time series shifted with respect to the other. Um, and then uh, find the tor which corresponds to the largest by absolute value, the largest positive or the largest negative uh, correlation. This would provide, I would say, a rather important information, but the details we will present tomorrow of how to implement it. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.